here today. Um, so I want to introduce Sharon Salzberg. Uh, many of you probably know of her, have uh, practiced with her, have read her books. Uh, we did actually a, a series with her recently on her new book, Real Change. If, if, if you haven't read it, um, please check it out. It's like the perfect book. I know she started like two or three years ago, but it, it arrived at like a perfect timing, I think, in our world today as we look at what does change look like um, internally and externally and how do we kind of help move into this next chapter of our world that has equality and has um, inner freedom and outer freedom. And so um, she's been dedicated for, I don't know how many years to, to meditation practice, to her own growth, to the growth and healing of the world. And she's somebody I've always looked to for advice. I depend on <laughs> when I moved to New York City many years ago, I wanted to do a program for incarcerated kids. And a friend of mine connected me with Sharon and Sharon's like, how can I help? What can I do? And she actually really helped a lot. <laughs> she got she got me on my first funding, actually. She didn't even know me from anybody. I was just this dude that just kind of arrived in New York City. She's like, how can I help you? Um, so um, just a big thank you, Sharon, for joining us today. And um, I know that you're a passionate um, voter and, and, and really um, also, you know, see that as a really important act. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for all that you do in the world. So I'm gonna pass it over to you. And um, let's see, you are live with us. Hey, hi. I'm uh, so happy to be with you. Thank you so much, Soren, and uh, everybody from Wisdom 2.0 for creating this opportunity because there are some moments in time where it just feels especially special to come together and have a sense of community in a world, especially now where it's so easy to feel isolated and, and cut off and, and really terribly alone. And here we are with some sense of common vision, perhaps. And for those of you who are in the United States who are eligible to vote, uh, who have not yet voted, please vote. It's really, it's so important. I've always felt that voting as an act was so consonant with the Buddhist teaching about everybody, everybody having innate worth, having innate dignity, and that expresses itself in this particular political system is everyone having a voice. Voting is really like the great equalizer. Everyone has a voice. Everyone should have a voice. I find it really a violation when that voice is taken away or threatened. And I voted, I voted this year uh, in this particular election um, with an absentee ballot that got dropped into a Dropbox, it wasn't quite the same thing as going into town hall in the town of Barry, Massachusetts and taking their pen and writing it. Uh, we vote in a very old fashioned way here and, and handing my ballot to somebody who shouts out my address. And, you know, and it's like, usually it's, there's much more ritual surrounding it. So I tried to create a ritual. Um, in some way, I wrote letters to other voters, urging them to vote, saying why I voted. I had them all on my altar, doing loving kindness over them for a long time. And then I had my own ballot on a different altar, doing loving kindness meditation over that for a long time. And um, what I want us to do together today is some loving kindness, but I'll, I'll speak first for a little while. Um, so I am in Barry, Massachusetts. Um, next door to the Insight Meditation Society, which is now closed. And uh, this set of stories that I often tell together in juxtaposition have to do with the founding of the Insight Meditation Society and the power of aspiration, having a really big vision of what we feel our lives are about, what gives us meaning, what joins us together, what we're capable of, what our limitations are. And the story begins when um, Joseph Goldstein and I met in India in uh, actually 1971, which was when I began meditating. And uh, I came back in 74 to the States as did he. And Jack Cornfield at the same time that we were in India was having like a parallel life in Thailand. So we all met up 
1974 in the States and began teaching together. And uh, after a while, our lives were, were very haphazard in those days. We, you know, we're sleeping on people's living room couches. We had nothing and uh, we'd get an invitation to lead a retreat. We never knew if there'd be another retreat till the next invitation arrived. Somebody would write a letter and say, I can get together some friends and a cook. Do you want to come teach a retreat? And we'd say, sure. And then we'd go teach that retreat. And somewhere in that process, somebody suggested to us that we start a retreat center an actual physical place. And they said it would be like a sacred site in this country, that it would be a place where the energy that gets engendered as people come together to practice um, could remain, could grow. And so we said, sure. And, and, and they also said the people who can help you are all on the East Coast, which was true. So we came back to the East Coast from where we were and looked up and down the East Coast for property and, and couldn't find anything really right. And then someone suggested we check out this novitiate, this Catholic novitiate in Barry, Massachusetts. So we came to look at it, at it a very cold day in December of 1975, and we couldn't decide what to do, whether we should purchase it or not. On one hand, it seemed perfect. It was it is pretty placid, nothing much happening here. Uh, it seemed like a perfect place for a retreat center. But on the other hand, it seemed vast. It was like so big. And we didn't know how many people in the West would be interested in meditation or this form of meditation. It was like, we just didn't know what to do. So we uh, went to downtown Barry for lunch. And Barry is a very classical New England town with a town green in the center of it. And in those days on the Barry town green, there was a monument which had engraved upon it the Barry town motto, which is tranquil and alert. So we took a look at that motto, tranquil and alert, and we said that must be an omen. Any town that has a motto like tranquil and alert should have a meditation center it because we talk about those qualities all the time. We deepen calm and tranquility and peace. And we also strengthen alertness and aliveness and connection through meditation. So we bought it. Now, it turns out the place which we bought, which was a novitiate, had been built in different stages. And the original building, the first building, was a private home. It was a mansion that was built by someone named Colonel Gaston, who at one point, Colonel Gaston was the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it turned out that Colonel Gaston had a personal motto that he tried to live by, which was, you should live every day so you can look any damn man in the eye and tell him to go to hell. So I read that and I, my first thought was, I wonder how well he was getting along with his neighbors who were maybe going around trying to be tranquil and alert. But I like those two stories in juxtaposition because I do believe we have conscious or half conscious or unconscious, we have some kind of theme. We have those North stars that are guiding how we navigate our lives. What gives our life meaning? What do we think is the most important element of being alive, what's the story we tell about who we are and what we can do and what we can't do? Now, I've had meditation teachers who often say, you know, our problem is not that that story is too ambitious, it's usually too small, it's too meager, it's too. Um, it, it just doesn't have enough of a sense of possibility of what we're really capable of. I had one teacher who would say to us, Tibetan teacher, basically, why do you think what your life is about is, is so nothing, you know? He said, why not aspire to be a fully liberated being for the sake of all beings, to be free of the forces that just drag us down and, and make us so cut off um, hatred, fear, 
jealousy, greed. Why not aspire to be a fully liberated being for the sake of all beings? Well, why not? So that's an interesting exercise and it's actually the first exercise we can do here together. If, if you wanna just, we'll sit together for a few moments. You don't have to think of it as a formal meditation. And just see, is there a story? Is there something that encapsulates your deepest wish for how you live this life, the impact you have, the sense of possibility? And if something comes up in your mind, see if you can make it a little bigger, a little braver. Okay, so for me, uh, for many years, I would say that story, that theme, my biggest aspiration would have to do with love, with bringing more love into this world. And the thing with aspiration, that kind of big vision, is that it has a life in terms of our intention, day by day, encounter by encounter conversation by conversation. What do we want to see in this conversation? What do we want to see come out of this encounter? A resolution? Do we want to be seen as right? Do we want to grind the other person into dust? Do we want to forge a different story right in this moment? So the aspiration doesn't like stay like a dream. It's given life through our daily lives, our ordinary way of being through the force of intention. What do we want to see happen? What's our priority? What do we care about more than anything? In this phone call, with this, what whatever it, it might be. So I wrote a book, um, not my most recent book that Soren mentioned, Real Change. It was a book before called Real Love. And in some ways that helped me find vocabulary for what I would call my aspiration. Um, there's a, basically the, almost the whole book was born out of this one line in a movie. The movie is called Dan in Real Life. Um, I came out uh, maybe 12, 13 years ago, something like that. And one of the characters in the movie says, love is not a feeling, it's an ability. Love is not a feeling, it's an ability. Dan in real life is the name of the movie. And I love that because of course, love is a feeling. It's maybe the feeling we yearn for and, and we, compete for and whatever, but it's also possible to see love as an ability, an ability to include, an ability to connect, an ability to care, not to objectify someone or someone's, not to dismiss them, not to discount them. In that vision, love is an ability, it's a capacity we have inside of us where we can have a worldview that everybody counts, everybody matters. That sense of love doesn't mean we like everybody. It actually doesn't mean we like anybody necessarily. It also doesn't mandate a certain kind of action. Like we're gonna have dinner together or I'm gonna give you money or I'm gonna say yes, or I'm gonna acquiesce or anything like that. The actions we take are based on hopefully awareness, sense of context, a particular moment in time, it's discernment, it's wisdom, it's understanding. But the love is, is the state of our hearts, the state of our minds that forms the, the basis of intention. It's not what we do, it's why we will do things. 
so if love is an ability, it means that it's different from how I'd always thought of it, which was kind of in the hands of another, almost like a commodity, a thing. And I kept getting this image of um, like the delivery person standing at my doorstep holding this package of love and looking down at the address and saying, nah, I'm going somewhere else. And I go like, wait a minute, then there's no love in my life. Then there's none. I'm bereft, I have nothing. But when I started thinking of love as a capacity and ability inside and understanding what it meant more, just that fundamental sense, that acknowledgement of connection Then I realized, oh, that was a tremendously empowering state. It wasn't in the hands of someone else. It was inside me to foster or nurture or whatever. And other people certainly might inspire it or ignite it or threaten it, but it's mine. It's my capacity. So uh, I wrote that book, um, I guess, uh, I turned it in a little over four years ago, like four years and two months ago, something like that. And the editor of the book kept saying to me, uh, you didn't finish the book. And I said, of course I finished the book. That's why I turned it in. And she said, no, you didn't finish the book. So I struggled for like two months to finish the book. And I kept staring at that screen and I could not finish the book. And then the 2016 presidential election happened and I finished the book in 15 minutes, which is why I bring it up now. And what happened in my mind was just the realization that I so much wanted um, to see love as a capacity, as an ability and, and the empowerment of that. And that if, if love was an ability, it was also a responsibility. That if I wanted to have love present in a conversation, maybe I had to be the one to bring it in to the room. If I wanted it to be present in um, an argument in, you know, with an adversary, it didn't mean giving up the intensity of, of my own sense of right and wrong or principles or, or the work that I was doing. But if I wanted love there, maybe I had to be the one to bring it in. And so I really, um, in these last four years, have been thinking so much about love as a responsibility, which actually, it doesn't feel like a burden. It feels like such an opening uh, to have that be the fundamental intention, the aspiration uh, manifest in real ways. You know, it's not just some la di da abstract thing in real ways. And to see what that means moment to moment. I see now uh, it means really um, often reaching for a place of of understanding and understanding so much that, again, you know, it doesn't mean giving up. I think that uh, the um, quotation of mine that has probably gotten most mileage on the internet is bit was one where I said, um, this is from the most recent book where I said something like compassion doesn't mean we don't fight. It means we don't hate. And so to explore the nature of love, the power of it, or loving kindness, as we would call it, or kindness, and um, to realize that it's a process. I mean, probably the most controversial thing, aside from seeing love as a strength, which is very controversial, that I've encountered in uh, all my years of teaching loving kindness meditation has been the idea that it can be cultivated. You know, we tend to think of these things as gifts, like you either have it or you don't. If you don't, you're out of luck. But 
certainly from the Eastern point of view, absolutely. These things are, are cultivated because they all depend on how we pay attention. They are emergent properties of being truly present with ourselves and with one another. If you're in a grocery store, let's say, even now, and you're looking right through that clerk as though they were an object rather than just pausing for a moment and recognizing this is a person with their own experience and uh, vulnerabilities and triumphs, you know, and hopes and fears, then we're not laying the ground, we're not creating the conditions for that sense of connection to emerge. But if we shift how we pay attention and we're truly there, that's when everything can happen. And so these practices aren't about pretending or trying to put a feeling on that we're not actually feeling. It's about taking some risks with our attention and stretching, looking at ourselves differently, looking at others, actually looking at them differently in our mind's eye. And so that's the practice I'd like us to do and especially take into this day because it's a day of lots of hopes and fears and expectations and desires and rightful desires um, and perhaps patience, you know, like waiting, 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 waiting and all kinds of things. Um, and depending on what your own vision is of what your life is about and the North Star that you navigate by and the things you want to cultivate, uh, here is something that you might keep in mind. So let's sit together. Uh, you may want to stretch or wiggle and uh, just stand up for a moment and then we'll begin. Okay. Um, I'll just emphasize again, uh, I'm reading the chat, some of the questions in the chat. Um, the meditation will be uh, probably 20 minutes. Um, the uh, practice um, is not one of forcing yourself to feel something. It's shifting the way we pay attention. We may not be feeling that great, you know, but in, in a sense, we enfold ourselves in our own field of care. It's very easy thinking about ourselves just to think about our faults and what's not working and go over that list and over that list and over that list and over that list never finding another fault, but nonetheless going over the list and just being tremendously discouraged. So we're shifting gears. That's not to say everything is perfect or that we're perfect, but let's give a little air time to what we normally don't pay much attention to, wishing ourselves well and folding ourselves in that, in that kind of care. And, and that's what we will, we will practice, don't worry, about being perfect, nobody is perfect. Um, but uh, there are elements within the practice that it's almost like exercising that muscle and, and it really does make a difference, it really does work. Okay, so if you wanna sit comfortably and just be at ease, you can close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. 
this particular practice is done by the silent repetition of certain phrases. The phrases are the way that we pay attention differently. You may have loving kindness practice. I'm sure many of you do. In which case you have phrases you feel comfortable with. That's fine. You can just keep using those. I'm going to suggest some phrases which you might try if you don't have phrases and if you don't feel a struggle with them. Ultimately, you want phrases. They may not be perfect, but they're good enough so that they're very general. You can make this offering to yourself and to others. And they cover a lot of different situations. The feeling tone is gift giving, it's offering, it's blessing. That's what we're doing in this practice. We repeat these phrases over and over again with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. This is like the song of the heart. And we begin with ourselves, making this offering to ourselves. We end with all beings everywhere, all of life. And what we do in the middle might change all of the time. So I'll guide you through just one possible variation. Common phrases offered to ourselves might be like, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Live with ease means in the things of day-to-day -day life like livelihood and family may it not be such a struggle. May I live with ease. May I be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. People often say to me, well, who am I asking? Well, we're not asking anybody. We're gift giving. This is generosity of the spirit. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And if you find your attention has wandered, you get lost in thought or spun out in a fantasy or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it, it's fine. We're more concerned with the next moment after we've been gone, after we've been lost. Because in that moment, we have the chance to be really different. So instead of judging ourselves and berating ourselves, we can let go and just begin again, bring our attention back to the phrases. We let go and we begin again. You haven't blown it. You haven't failed. We say actually that the healing is in the return, not in never having wandered to begin with. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
Let's see if you can bring to mind what we call a benefactor. That's someone who's helped you. Maybe they've helped you directly. They've helped pick you up when you've fallen down. Or maybe they've inspired you from afar. You've never met them. This is like an embodiment of the, the power of love for you. Could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. These days, I actually often use a puppy as a benefactor because my friends adopted a puppy and they're a lot happier than they were before. So I think of that puppy and I just smile. So is there someone like that for you? And if there is, you can bring them here. You can get an image of them. You can say their name to yourself. You can get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words don't seem perfect, that's okay. They're carrying the heart's energy. They're carrying that different way of paying attention. So they're serving us. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And let's see if others come to mind who've helped you in some way. We'll have a gathering that could include that grocery store clerk, by the way. Just see who comes up in your mind. And we'll offer loving kindness to the group. You may not know everyone's name, but you can have a sense of them. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
And someone that you know that's struggling. They're lonely. They're frightened. Whatever may be happening. They're sick. If someone like that comes to mind, you can bring them here. And offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. This is a way of being fully present. It doesn't mean you never do anything about anything, but it's a way of maintaining connection because it's hard, isn't it? May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Remember we're offering a blessing, a gift as best as we can. And then I'd say those that you feel in alliance with, whoever comes to mind. And this is a kind of celebration. And a sense of community. May you be safe. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And just for fun, let's spend a few moments offering loving kindness to those we don't feel in harmony with. Remember, we're not saying may you be successful. <laughs> uh, it's more a sense of may you be free of hatred. Wouldn't this world look like a different place? May you be filled with loving kindness if you need to change the words or the words, the same old words can suffice if we really understand what they mean. But you can feel free to change the words. It's an acknowledgement of the interconnection of life that the most powerful way forward may be a sense of we. The 
that, as the Buddha said, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. And then finally, all beings everywhere, connecting to the boundlessness of life, those close to us, those far away. All beings, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, may all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy. Live with ease. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you so much. Um, may we all bring forth more and more of this consciousness, this energy into our lives. Somebody this morning, if I was talking to a friend and she said she taught her three-year-old child loving kindness meditation and her, her uh, daughter would say things like, um, may everybody be like a dinosaur. May everybody be bouncy. And I love that, especially the bouncy part. So whatever words work for you, uh, let's see what we can do about including everybody. And um, Soren, I have a question for you because I know uh, not everybody who was intending to come was able to come. Is this available if people want to tune into it? Yeah, so this is being recorded um, on on uh, YouTube and also on Zoom. So there'll be a YouTube link that we can send everybody who missed it live. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, I can send that to you. Okay, you great. Can share it. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Soren, again. Thank you so much, Sharon. And so, yes, if you have friends or anybody who... Um, 
wants to see this, who missed this, um, we will send a link to everybody uh, on the list and you can um, share it with friends uh, or you can watch it again or do the meditation again. Uh, and just a reminder, we'll be back here at noon PST and uh, 6 p.m. PST for more sessions. Sorry to our friends in Europe and Asia that that ends up being like two in the morning or four in the morning too. Uh, the time zones, we just do our best with what we can. Uh, but apologies if, if um, you know, those are strange times for you. Um, but we will, share, um, we will share all the sessions via email so you can go back and watch them later. Um, deep thanks to Sharon. Um, I will maybe unmute everybody and we can say some blessings and, and uh, wishes of well-being to all of us. And if you go to gallery view, uh, you can actually um, see everybody. So let's see, if you go to gallery view, we can say, and you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, thank, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Blessings to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Blessings and love, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Blessing, blessing. Thank you. 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 See you at noon, Sharon. Much love. This is thank you. Much love. See you at noon. Love, love. Me hope. Thank you. Nice. Everyone vote. Yeah, noon hopefully again. <laughs> yeah. Blessings, everyone. Yeah, that's what it's like to be enfolded in care.